The recording is getting ready to start. Okay, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much, first and foremost, for life. God, if we woke up this morning, we still have purpose in our bones, purpose and reason for being, purpose and reason for living, Lord. So we thank you for this. We thank you that through the night, you kept our lungs breathing, you kept our hearts beating. God, you did all these little things that we take for granted each and every day. We love you. We thank you for this time of convening hearts, minds, and souls. We pray that the discussion will be beneficial to everyone. And uh, we thank you again for your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Goodbye, everyone from South Africa. Bye, sir. Hey, Greg, 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 we're, Greg, we're going to have to talk one on one before I travel to South Africa. I have a note I'm getting ready to send to you right now. All right. God bless you. All right. Brother. Bless you too. Bye now. Thank you, sir. Okay, for those who are in, and hopefully we get more people. Actually, 20 people said they would show up. So we're going to take for granted that maybe the change in time that I put out may have caused the uh, delay with some people getting on. But uh, I try to recommunicate back out uh, that we had changed the time. So, uh, Tyrone? Yes, sir. I see a Von H among uh, yeah, us. Who yeah, is I, that? Von H, who are you? Von H. I have no idea who that might be. Um, I don't want to reject anyone from the meeting, but uh, uh, I do like to know who who's in. Like you would, Roger, I kind of want to see faces and you could be a Facebook spy, Von H. <laughs> Von H, can you identify yourself? Let me ask to... Uh, Hello. Bon? Now there are some people do have difficulties with connecting, so I'm gonna make the assumption that's what's going on with that person, okay? Okay. Okay, so we are recording the meeting now, and uh, it is a very inconvenient topic of, topic of discussion. Uh, it's one of the things that are called the tough uh, topics. And, uh, but I think there are some benefits if we can explore it uh, with the understanding of what we're trying to achieve, what the outcome of this discussion will be about. Uh, the goal is to do a deep dive into issues that I feel my opinions and does not reflect anybody in here, strictly how I have viewed things. Now, some of the uh, old symptoms of discrimination, uh, oppression has impacted our way of living and our way of thinking about ourselves. Um, I list about six topics of which I would like to cover today in our discussion. And uh, one of those start off with the color, colorblind society. Well, that's a tough one, right? And um, we know that in the late six, 60s, uh, underneath the uh, leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, in order to disengage the ignorance and stupidity that uh, Americans imposed upon people of color because of their, because they were black, um, he channeled, challenged the world to judge us based on the content of our character, not the color of our skin. That was a beautiful slogan, and I think it resonated to the world that we are a people of integrity, uh, which we should be treated that way. Do not just look at our color because they were focusing on color alone. But let me share this vision with you guys. You might understand why I say that it's part of the symptoms of inferiority. Um, if in fact, in a vision I had some time ago, if I died and go to heaven, for instance, and I would stand before the presence of the Almighty and say, well, my father, while on earth, uh, I made 
many friends that were very dear to me. And uh, it was a, because of the content of my character that they accepted me. And I proved to them that I was worthy to be accepted. And this vision that I had, it appeared to me that God would ask me, well, it would say to me, well, Tyrone, uh, wonderful that they accepted your character. I'm grateful for that. But I, your God, I made your color. Who convinced you to not look at what I made to be a good purpose, which is the color of your skin? Who convinced you that you had to, to humble yourself to be the way they wanted you to be and deny what I made you to be? So from that vision that I had, I share it with you guys. Um, I don't want to be accepted in parts. You have to accept all of me. If you cannot accept the color of my skin and thereby I have to over project the color of my skin based upon the content of my character, I am thereby given into an inferiority complex. Now, again, I applaud the efforts and the thoughts that went into that slogan that drove away a lot of the evilness that we dealt with as individuals. But if you do not love all that you see, then you cannot love me. And furthermore, I'll say to you, to everyone who's listening, if you go back, no other race had to adjust to that kind of slogan. You couldn't tell people in Asia, or Japanese or Chinese origin that, you know, don't look at my slanted eyes, you know, look at the content of my character. That doesn't work here. It doesn't work in India if you tell somebody, well, you look like this, but I can accept you if you comply to that. That doesn't happen to any other race on the earth except our race. So I'm saying, and I'm now open up for discussion about this, I think we need to step away. We need to recognize the importance of that slogan, but we need to step away to be who we are in total, not in part. And that being said, I'm going to be quiet and listen to some of you guys make comments about that. I can't hear you, sir. It's interesting that you raised that. What's what's interesting <clears throat> is that um, as I reflect on my life, I stepped away from that concept when I was eight years old, and I'm 75 now. Uh, when I heard Martin Luther King Jr. say that, I, I only said to him, amen. I've been thinking this way for a very long time. Uh, but um, my perspective is I don't have to ask permission from anyone to accept me based on the content of my character. It is a given. It is, it is a, 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 a matter of my existence. And so I move forward uh, uh, becoming all that I can become. And I've always done that from childhood and, and, and not allowed someone else to define me. In fact, um, uh, on my Facebook page, what I write is that I strive always to avoid being defined by popular culture. Uh, that, that is how I go about my life. And, and I've been able to develop relationships with all kinds of people as a result of that, because I simply don't uh, once you embrace that concept, you hit the nail right on the head. You accept the assumption of inferiority and therefore an obligation, and therefore an obligation to, to uh, accent your character uh, for other people when that's simply not necessary at least for me. Ms. Valerie, would you like to share an opinion about it? I, I saw you listening, but also I was looking at the way you were listening, so it tells me that you have some beautiful thoughts to share. <laughs> and if it's, I guess that's fine. Just... No, no, um, you know, kind of, kind of my background is coming up as the preacher's daughter, uh, you know, my dad's a minister, two of my three brothers, are you know pastors of course so my upbringing was 
and we were kind of in an interracial religion. So it's ironic that, you know, the subject of race and color and the differences, um, we kind of, everybody was judged accordingly, you know, to who they were. And it wasn't until I reached more of a teenage years that I started facing this overt racism. And, um, and it was a shock to me that, wow, the way I look really, really affects someone else this way. It was, you know, it kind of hit me at a later <laughs> age and maybe some people that, you know, there was such overt racism. I knew it existed, but it didn't really affect me until I, you know, hit my teen years. And it kind of happened abruptly as we went to a, a skating rink. It was a group of us who went skating, black and white, and um, they couldn't find my shoes, but I went to <laughs> retrieve my shoes to turn in my skates. And uh, they said, well, who took them? I said, well, that boy right there took them. And the guy said, who are you calling a boy? It was a white guy. Who are you calling a boy? You and B. And I was just like, my eyes just blurted open. And I couldn't believe he just said this to me because I couldn't find my shoes. And then someone else who was not really, you know, related to us, a black guy jumps over the gate. And there's like a race riot that starts here all because I couldn't find my shoes. And I said, the boy took them. There was a little 10 year old kid probably that, that took the shoes. And it just, you know, it floored me. So here I am talking to the police to tell them, well, this is what happened. You know, but I'm 15 years old when this, when this occurred. So it kind of, you know, it was a blind side. Like, why is this so, such a serious issue? You know, and what was wrong with me calling a 10 year old kid a boy? <laughs> You know, it was just, you know, and, and you know, I mean, there's other things that have happened in the course of time, of course, you know, but, but um, like I said, you know, judging someone by the content, that's always, you know, it's always what I've done. It's always what I've learned, you know, learned to do. Um, and that's how, that's just how I've accepted other people. And, you know, I hope they accept me that way. And if they choose not to, that's fine because that's their issue and not mine. So I've had to, to learn to just that that was their issue, and that's something they have to deal with. You know, um, you know. Of course, in this world and day and time, there are some other issues that <laughs> we deal with, especially in America. Um, um, especially, you know, as you as you've seen, you know, with police interactions and just, you know, if you've heard about the Karens and the. And the <laughs> the Beckys and whatnot, you know, there's other issues that are going on too. But like I said, that's their issue. And they just try not to internalize what someone else's problem may be. Now, Aluka, this may be more so an American issue, but uh, Nigeria, you guys have had your issues over there too with the so-called superior race. Uh, and uh, with the oil industry, as you spoke of, uh, that you've shown pictures to me about and uh, share it with me, by the way, uh, how your natural resources are taken from the land and there's no benefits. So uh, I don't think it's a fact of content of character. It's a content of humanality, respecting the humans. You and your family and other members in Nigeria uh, should be more respected, but they, there's no respect there. But anyways, I think you got what we're talking about, but you have any comments to share? All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tyron. Well, it's a very pathetic situation here in Nigeria, uh, especially the Niger Delta part of Nigeria. We're facing inferiority to the highest peak. Now, this is the experience we are having here in Nigeria. So, the white skin colored people who will refer to as the foreigners, uh, the IOCs, the oil exploration companies, when they come to Nigeria, when they come to our environment here, they explore our oil, they, they expose gas flare to the atmosphere without considering the air challenge of our people here. And you know, when we go and when we approach these people, 
They in turn collaborate with the government of Nigeria, with the, some, some leaders from this place, uh, our communities, our local communities, they give them money to shut those who can speak for the common people here in Nigeria. So the situation here is very pathetic. And uh, we've cried, we've been calling international communities, the UN and other bodies to come to our aid. If you come to my community here, there's gas flare, a 24 hour gas flare and carbons are being exposed to the environment causing a lot of health hazards. But the, the, the white people whom have come to Nigeria here, to our community, to exploit our oil, they don't care about our, they don't care about our health. They don't care about the old people's health. They don't care about the children's health. They don't care about the middle age health. All they are interested is a, a flow of the oil they explore. They don't want any disruption of the oil they're exploring from our communities, but they don't care about our health. So the issue of inferiority, it goes down beyond treating one physically. What we experience here, what we experience here in, in Nigeria, it, it, I, I, have, I have pictorial evidence of what we experience here. I have pictorial evidence where I can't bring to this forum for you all to see. You see, um, we have this uh, oil company, Shell, Chevron, and different oil companies in our communities. But we don't have the impact, the physical impact. We give, we export crude oil, referred to as a black gold, to UN, to UK, US, other part of the world. But we cannot boast of uh, a average Nigeria, a average Niger data cannot boast of having a, a good job to sustain his or herself here. And uh, I think uh, some, some months back, I've shared my experience with Mr. Tyron about how we are being treated here by the oil companies. I think all this revolve around the, uh, the oppression of the black race. They come into our country, our community, to even show us superiority. Why they make us feel inferior in our own land. And we have nothing or less to do because they have every security around them. They have every security that protect them. They have the army, they have the police that protect them from we assessing them. So it, it's a challenge we are facing here. The racism is a challenge we are still facing here in our own country. The white is oppressing us in our own motherland here in Nigeria. And I will be very happy if this platform, uh, if uh, exploring Africa, the continent Africa, if this platform can raise up programs to come and give some awareness programs here in Nigeria or uh, in my own uh, Niger Delta region. I tell you, it's a very terrible situation here in Nigeria. And I have so many pictures and video clips that I can show to you where our people are passing through a lot of health challenges without nothing or less being done to ameliorate the situation here. I, I will stop here um, for now. And uh, I, think, I, still, I still have more to say, but for now, I just want to stop here. And I believe I want the whole world to know that the, the whites, those feeling superior, feeling superiority over the black, they are even coming to Nigeria here yeah, to show the superiority. And they are coming here with every security, so we have nothing or less to do about it. Thank you very much for the opportunity to also uh, give you a brief light about 
what we experience here in Nigeria. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Valerie, just for a point of introduction, Mr. Aluka Obe has the aspiration to one day become the president of Nigeria. So that I spoke of earlier, I'll speak now. You're looking at a young Barack Obama, uh, upcoming person. So uh, we are fortunate to have him in our meeting. I'm blessed to have met him as we have met. And, uh, these are the people that we need to connect with. And uh, in the month of November, by the way, just a reminder, I'm going to ask us who are conveniently comfortable with our friends to get to know someone on the other side of the world. And Valerie, you're already there, uh, your brother and people that you're going to meet and get to know in Uganda. But we need to kind of reach out to each other, know each other much better. Now, uh, the other topic that I wanted to discuss specifically applies to us here in America. And those who have done well, brought up by their parents and grandparents, to work twice as hard as the white Americans who work in order to receive what might be a sliver of success. And uh, thereby we have academically achieved, we've done great things in our lives as people of color, but that to me is accepting in a, an inferiority complex that I have to work harder. I have to be twice as smart just to get a half of what somebody white is getting. And the question about this whole summary today is are we black people really inferior? It's not saying that we are, but the, the games that have been played upon us to place us in a position to feel like we are inferior certainly has been what has happened to us. And, uh, but uh, I, I want to have throw these things out because I think we need to discuss them. And uh, for instance, the uh, work twice as hard. I met a young lady who was a professional. She was a doctor uh, while I was staying in Virginia. And she said, well, my dad raised me up to be, the, uh, to do that, work twice as hard. I said, but listen, I myself, if I believe that's something I want to do, then I'll work twice as hard. But I'm not going to work twice as hard to prove to somebody that, because I'm black, I got to prove to you that I'm twice as better as the person who's white. I told that person, I am not going to buy into that concept. If I'm personally motivated to achieve, you don't need to tell me to work twice as hard. That's just who I am innately as a human being. So I'm not going to let, let that pressure of what has been placed upon our ancestors to say, well, Tyrone, work twice as hard. And maybe you might get a crumb off of the table. It doesn't work that way. But anyways, I want to throw that out and see what uh, opinions of others might be. And Bob, thank you for putting on your visual, by the way. Uh, oh, anybody care to comment about that? Uh, yeah. Um, Tyrone, it, it, it's, it's interesting. I've, 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 I've thought a lot about this. Uh, and I recall that someone said of Barack Obama during his administration, you have to be twice as good and half as white uh, or half as black. Um, it depends on which, which side of the equation you're looking at it in. But, you know, a, as I think about that, there, there, there are two perspectives that come to my mind. One is we start from a place where we're not playing on a level playing field. Uh, at the very beginning. Uh, we start from a place of disadvantage and that disadvantage is not an accident. That disadvantage is purposeful by those who have put us at a disadvantage. Uh, so, so starting from a disadvantage, if you're going to live out your life and accomplish what you will, uh, the, the, the option that's available to you is to work twice as hard. That's, that's one of the only avenues of success available to you. The other perspective, however, though, is uh, if you're convinced uh, in that scenario that you have to work twice as hard because of something inherent or innate then you've got a problem because that is what racism does to us. It says you are inferior and therefore before we will accept you as 
uh, let's say before we will accept you because they don't accept us as equal, but before we will accept you at all, you're going to have to demonstrate through your effort and hard work that you are worthy. I reject that second perspective, but I recognize the first. We are functioning from a position of disadvantage and the way to overcome that disadvantage is to work harder. That's right. Uh, Ms. Valerie, do you care to speak as a female who obviously have, have more challenges than the black male, I would think, in terms of how that tennis shoe issue that you told me about earlier, uh, and the mere fact that the little white guy called you an NP. Um, what about from your perspective? Have you in your life had to, were you compelled to work harder uh, to go against your uh, would-be other employees because you were black or, and you're in the banking industry too, I believe, is that correct? Right, yeah, I've been banking and insurance, yes, for 30 years plus, but, um, it's, um, you know, maybe, I mean, and part of this, like I said, I have to go back to upbringing because that has a lot to do with, you know, my way of, of you know, handling the situations or, or, or maybe, you know, conquering certain challenges. But, you know, from, from school, beginning in school, it was like, you know, you're always, you know, you always got to strive to be the best. My mother was really great at that, in education and making sure, you know, we had all of our, our studies completed, you know, and as uh, the minister's children, we had to have our Bible lessons completed before we could do our school lessons. So I looked forward to school. <laughs> so, but, you know, but just having that regiment of uh, reading and learning and education, that started early. Um, then it was as I like I said as I began to get a little bit older then I could see where there were um, you know challenges of having to be better than uh, you know or uh, you know that challenge of you know doing working twice as hard to just get you know equal or less than pay and it was frustrating you know but then it's like keep just keep doing what I've been doing because what I was doing was really kind of setting me up to kind of work through this racial problem. You know, I did work hard. I always worked hard. I always kind of stressed over working hard because I always wanted to be, you know, top of the class, top of this, you know, better at this. And it kind of gave me a, a I'd say a better jump start in some aspects. But um, yeah, then I could see there was less reward though. You know, there were times and challenges when I got into the workforce where well, they didn't want to promote me, but they wanted me to train the people that they promoted, <laughs> you know, or, you know, there, there was this, this secondary exception, you know, oh, we'll pay you more, but we won't give you this position of control or, you know, or, uh, uh, you know, of, a, of, you know, a higher position of authority. We won't give you that, but we'll, we'll compensate you, <laughs> basically, is what I saw later on. So those are the challenges I faced, you know, uh, you know, later on. Yeah. Well, especially when you're in banking, especially in banking. <laughs> I worked a few years in the, the finance industry, so, and I saw the red lining that I'm sure you're familiar with. Oh, yes. <laughs> so. Oh, yes. And now, uh, Luca, and, and on, on H, uh, thank you for putting your video on. I appreciate it. Um, sorry, but we wanted to make sure we knew everybody who was there, and, uh, do you care to make a comment, Vaughn? Hello? I think you might have difficulties connecting. Uh, uh, Luca, I don't know if there's any similarities in the on your continent of Africa, Nigeria, where uh, Nigerians um, work hard and would be the white counterparts. I'm sure it exists. And you get half the money or no money at all. But uh, just kind of curious if you would share with us what your experiences are with uh, how life has treated you, if you don't mind. Sorry, sir, please. Can you come back? Uh, 
we are talking about in America how we have to work twice as hard just to get a little piece of the cornbread that is shared uh, by our white counterparts. And uh, we are wondering what the conditions are for you as a native Nigerian uh, that you have encountered that uh, have made it um, uh, difficult for you to kind of feel like you are treated right as a human being. And that's what I'm trying to say. I mean, I'll be clear. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to send somebody a link to the meeting at the same time. So forgive me if I'm not fully uh, confidently saying what I need to say. But what issues have you encountered, uh, Luca, uh, that when you see the white Europeans who are in Nigeria, how they're living and how you have been born there, work just as hard, but you're receiving less, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you see what the Americans, the character they, they express towards Nigerians here, yeah, I think uh, is a step and a, is is a challenge to us here in Nigeria to work hard and and we are just hoping one day the story will change, just like we are doing now. Just like this platform exploring the Africa continent is doing. I believe when this whole program goes around and try to get into the heart of the people, even the Americans will come to the senses that what they are doing to the Black, what they are doing to Nigerians, what they are doing to Africans, they will have to come to their conscious, subconscious mind that uh, they are really not treating us bad. And I wish that day to come, and I wish it to come very soon because, uh, you see, this ill treatment has resulted to a lot of anarchy and violence here in Nigeria, especially in some part of Africa. And it is because of this ill treatment uh, it, Make, making us look like slaves in our own land, in our own country that has made some of the youths take up arms against the Americans and even the government that are collaborating with these people. And uh, like what Mr. Roger said, it is for us to work harder to become a better person of our own version of who we are. So. As a young Nigerian that I am, I'm trying to change the narrative by not looking, by looking beyond what, beyond my environment, by looking beyond the government and the whites, how they are treating us. That is why I tap, I key into this program. I, I think I'm the, the young Nigerian myself and Mr. Black. Black Lemon, we are the only Nigerians that are pursuing to participate in this program, this whole program, and we call it a real privilege. I don't think uh, any Nigerian who is in the same age bracket with me and even far above me have had this such opportunity to come here to speak to people who have experienced, uh, who are, who are Timpa on Caliber. And, you know, uh, I think I have been encouraged. I have been pushed to work harder. And that is what I am trying to do here in Nigeria because my thinking and my orientation has changed about the environment. Because here in Nigeria, if this is my right and I want it, you deny me of it, we go into violence, any means to get it. But as an exposed person that I am, I have, I have changed the narrative by not, by going peaceful, by going, by handling things peacefully or using dialogue means to demand for what I know is my right. So 
I, I think I'm living also living a, a footprint to be a better me for my children and prosperity to speak about me tomorrow. So, so it is what your personal motivation happens to be. Uh, I wanted to welcome uh, to the room Mr. Anton Hall, very distinguished member of the uh, Exploring the Content of African in Africa, and he is very distinguished, got a uh, great education as well. And uh, But we are now in the midst of the discussion. I apologize to you, sir, for your, the inconvenience that you have encountered. But uh, we're talking about, the, obviously, the touchy subject about are we inferior because we're Black? And that's just the point for which uh, we need to kind of talk about why some of these things might be forced upon us to think that way if we do feel inferior. And it's, it's perfectly OK. With the centuries of oppression that we have gone through as Black people, to OK to say, look, I, have, I was inferior, but I know that I'm not inferior, if that makes sense. But uh, also, I want to welcome Mr. Lemon Black. He uh, He's in the room as well. He is the recording artist. And Mr. Madison, I've sent you a uh, copy of his song so you can listen to it, Africans Unite. Uh, Mr. An Anton, if you want to just say in the subject we're talking about now of being inferior is working twice as hard, probably get less compared to a white counterpart. If you want to share your opinion about that. Yeah, sure. First of all, thank you for having me. And second of all, I apologize for the clutter in the back. I'm in my niece's bedroom because it's kind of brighter in here. So <laughs> that's what all this anime stuff is. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I think this is an important topic because um, as I'm sure you guys have been talking about, and again, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm late. Um, we have been instructed or conditioned, right, by our society to consider ourselves as second-class citizens in many ways, even, even on a subconscious level, right? So even if it's not on a conscious level, on a very subconscious level, that's something that we've been taught. And speaking of having to work twice as hard, you know, to obtain to um, levels of success, it's very true. That's something that my parents taught me growing up in the United States, that, that I, as a Black man in America, I was going to have to be twice as good at something in order to obtain success, to obtain levels of success that I would have to always dot my I's and cross my T's, right? They taught me to speak in a very specific manner. They said, the your white counterparts at school are going to be able to slip up and use slang and mispronounce words all the time, and they're not going to be looked at as inferior. But if you decide you want to use slang or slip up and mispronounce a word or use improper grammar, that's going to be a poor reflection on your entire community, your entire race as a black person. They're gonna use that as fuel to feed that um, lie that we're inferior, right? So I remember carrying that burden that um, now I have to represent my entire race, right? I'm not just representing Anton, I'm representing all black people around the world when I walk, when I talk, when I'm um, going about my business. And yeah, I remember working twice as hard. Um, some examples too, which play into that preconceived idea that we're inferior is that, um, for example, I'm a writer. And so that has always been one of my strong suits. And I remember being in school and submitting papers, and I'm sure some of you can relate to this. And the teacher would say, call me up and say, you wrote this, Anton? You really wrote this? And I was like, yes, why? They're like, this is so good. And of course, if I were white, that would not be an issue. But because I was black, they were shocked that I could write, you know, a well thought out and creative paper right? And it would sometimes be the best paper in class. And they were shocked that it was produced by a black person because their preconceived notion was that I was inferior, including being an inferior writer, right? Um, so yeah, that has definitely played a role in my life. And um, it colors so many different aspects of, of our lives, unfortunately. And it's something that we have to navigate as Black people. It's an extra layer of stress that we have to worry about when we go out into the world, right? When we navigate the workforce, 
Um, these are things that we always have to be conscious of. And so, yeah, um, I think this is an important conversation for us to have. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move to the other area of the discussion, and I think it kind of plays into what you just said. Well educated and wealthy, but yet and still, we are treated less than the most uneducated white Americans in our country. It's not a question about it, it's factual. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen some of the senators who were pulled over driving while, while black. Doesn't seem to happen to uh, white Americans that way. But this is another part of the inferiority complex. No matter how successful you speak, you write, how wealthy you are, how much education you, ha you have, you still proceed to be inferior. That the way it is, Oluca in, in America. We are still perceived to be that way because of our skin color. We are designated by them to feel that we are inferior. So um, I'm sure you guys have encountered this, this kind of issue of treatment uh, yourself, but you know within who you are, you know your capabilities, you know your, your intellect, but yet and still, the world that we live in, specifically those who seem to be judgmental, look upon us as we are incapable in that we are second class citizens. I know we all reject it and we have to do that because that's part of what God made us to be, to be uh, respected and treated like other human beings. And we shouldn't live in, in, in a, any other way than that. But I'm gonna back away and let you guys share it. Maybe some experiences that you have or some learning to be helpful to everybody. And by the way, this is gonna be posted out on YouTube so hopefully those who listen to the comments that are being made today, they will be uplifted, okay? Mr. Madison, do you care to speak on that, sir? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, Oluku, uh, we uh, African-American fathers were taught by our fathers and our grandfathers to have what we call the talk with our sons. Which, which is to teach them how they should respond when uh, uh, stopped inappropriately by a police officer, and particularly a police officer, someone who carries a gun and who is authorized to shoot and kill you. Uh, we have to teach our sons how to conduct themselves. And, 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 and I was taught very well uh, <clears throat> as, as, as a child, uh, from a very young age, I grew up in the South in uh, the state of Virginia. And um, we were in this sleepy little Southern town that was run by uh, uh, the, uh, the white power structure. And um, I'll tell a story a little bit later about my hometown that I won't now. But what's interesting is that having learned from the talk how to conduct myself uh, I have been stopped on numerous occasions by police officers. And after all of those encounters, my wife has said to me, how did you get away with that? Because what I have learned from the talk is that if I speak to them um, uh, positively and directly, uh, it disarms them. Uh, I drive an expensive automobile, and I have been stopped on a number of occasions. The last time I was stopped, I made a U-turn in the middle of the street so that I could get a parking space on the other side of the street. And as I was backing into that parking space, a police officer drove up beside me. Uh, he rolled down his window, I rolled down my window, and he said, um, Sir, uh, do you understand that U-turns are illegal in this city? And I said, uh, uh, no, sir, I, 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 I did not. And um, I, I saw this parking space and, I, and, and I, 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 it, it seemed safe to me to make that U-turn. And what he said to me in response was, well, I tell you what, if you promise not to do that again, uh, uh, that'll be okay with me. 
And I said, yes, I promise. And she said, how did you get away with that? <laughs> you didn't even get a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> but I have always looked them directly in the face and, 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 and directed my comments positively and confidently. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I have avoided some of the, the very negative experiences of being dragged out of my car at gunpoint and, and such. But I grew up in a time when uh, I could not eat in a restaurant. I could not drink at a white water fountain because in Virginia where I grew up, there were water fountains labeled white and black. And um, um, I had to walk around the back of the building to get my food. I could not walk into a restaurant. I had to sit on the back of the bus. All of those things um, constantly were trying to inform me that I was inferior, I simply rejected them. And I conducted myself with confidence and with, uh, with, with self-respect because our grandparents taught us that whenever you leave home, uh, Anton, they, they told us directly, you absolutely have to represent our race. You need to show these white folk that we are not inferior as, as they seem to want us to be. And the only way to, to counter that is to act differently. And that's what I've always done. Beautiful. <laughs> right. Are you on the spot again? If you shared some of your experiences. Who, uh, who is that for? Valerie, uh, if you will. Um, <laughs> as he was he was speaking, it kind of reminded me of some instances. I wish Tracy were on here because this is his story. <laughs> I'm Tracy, the wonderful so, speaker here. This, and this is his story. You know, I mean, it goes back to when um, you know the busing began. You know, they started you know busing blacks to the you know uh, outer lining county schools, and I missed that part. I was just a little bit older than them, so I kind of missed that. But he and my sister were bused to um, a school that was in an all-white neighborhood. And the first thing they did was wanted to test them. They, you know, give them, you know, uh, you know, different tests. And so they did these IQ tests. Well, you know, they were in the school for probably a month. And after the results came back, they found that his IQ and my sister's IQ were at a genius level. So I think his was 146, hers was 136. From that day forward, he began to be harassed by the phys ed teacher of all people. Just harassed for no reason whatsoever because they knew he was smart and they were threatened by it. You know, my sister got a little bit of it, but my brother really caught the brunt of it. And it got to a situation where the teacher actually there were people standing in line in a hallway. You know, our brother, the preacher's son, you know, he's standing there, you know, quietly. And he tells him to be quiet. And he takes my brother's books and shoves them into his stomach. He tells him to shut up. He's like, you know, everybody saw he was quiet, but, you know, he wants to harass him. And anyway, my brother, he got upset. He went to the principal's office, went straight to the principal's office. They didn't tell him to go. He went there and told him, you need to do something about this teacher or else I'm gonna have your job. And this is what he told the principal. <laughs> so immediately they went, calm down, you know, he went in there like a man and told him, I'm gonna have your job. You don't do something about him. And that it, it kind of changed things from that point forward. But he went and told him that if he didn't do something about this teacher and he even told him about all the harassment he had gone through, you know, my parents had to go up there and, you know, you know, because they didn't even know what was going on. And, uh, you know, so it, it, it shut it down immediately, but, but, um, you know, like I said, he, he, he went in very authoritatively and told him that he's going to have his job. <laughs> uh, Mr. Madison, you must meet uh, Professor G as I referred to him, her, her brother, Tracy. I will make sure. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, you guys got to meet. Yeah. 
Mr. Luca, I think you're sitting there, uh, sir, if you want to chime in and we're talking about being well educated, being wealthy, if that might be the case, and still treated not equal, but less than a poor white human being part of the inferiority complex that this world seems to land us in place us in. So if you care to speak from your Nigerian perspective, I would be appreciative. And by the way, again, everybody, just to make you aware, Mr. Aluka has the plans to run for the president of Nigeria one day. So uh, just be aware, you're looking at a young distinguished gentleman. And uh, I think that he's going to achieve that. But anyways, I'll be quiet and let you speak if you care to do so. You're muted. Uh, take your mute off. You muted uh, your speaker, Luca. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tyron. And uh, I want to once again say thank everyone that have been part of the program, uh, that have been part of the meeting. Uh, Please, uh, can you please just rephrase on what I should talk, speak on, sir? Uh, let's say in your own country, Nigeria, you are the most educated person over there. And also you're the most wealthy person in Nigeria. If you go out in the communities and there are whites who are there, would they look upon you as being above them or are you being below them? Your perception, how you are perceived as a human being. Do they see you as being less regardless of how educated you might be or how wealthy you might be? Do they look down upon you uh, because of your skin color? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Do you see that or has it, have you experienced that in Nigeria? All right, thank you very much. I think before now, before now, before exploring the continent Africa, before this day, if I see any American in Nigeria, because of the value, the orientation I've had from a childhood, I would always take him to be superior over me. But, but now that I have, hello, can you hear me? Yes. But now that I, I, I've, been, I've been given the orientation, now that I've built my mind, I have the awareness. I think no matter what, if, if I have money or I'm the richest in my community, I will always put the white, the American, where it belongs in my own community. And that has to do with how I packaged myself, which is the mindset, that how you present yourself. Make them, they say, the way you present yourself, that's how you will be addressed. So even the president or the, the Nigerian states, they can, they, can be, they can feel inferior before the Americans here in Nigeria. It, it, it's, it's just, a, it's, like, it's like a syndrome. It's like a syndrome here in Nigeria that the, the, the Americans are superior over the black, over the Nigerian. And uh, honestly, from this day forth, that thought had changed within me. My mindset had changed because, because I have, I, have been, I have been taught and I have been teach how uh, the whites are not inferior over the black because I have been made to understand that we are the greatest black Africans, we are the greatest people in the world. So in my community here, uh, I encounter such situation. I will present myself in a way that non, not even the America or the expatriate, the whites, we want to oppress me with their skin, with the color of their skin in my own country. That has to do because I have changed my mindset and my orientation has changed. 
towards the white, that they are not superior over me. Bless you. Bless you. Mr. Anton, do you care to expound? So we're going to the next subject, or do you have some comments? Um, I think we could go ahead and move on to the next topic. I just wanted to um, say in response to what the gentleman before me was saying is that, um, like he said, like you pointed out, it is about our own orientation towards ourselves that really matters. You know, um, it's how we view ourselves, how we understand ourselves. And that really is what matters, right? Um, there will always be someone out there who looks down on you for a multitude of reasons, right? Including our, the, our race, our color, our skin color. Um, but the way we view ourselves, the way we carry ourselves, the way we learn about ourselves um, is really important. And I just wanted to add that I was fortunate enough to have been brought up in a household where my father really taught me about our history starting in Africa. I think a lot of African-Americans, unfortunately, uh, especially because the schooling system out here does a very poor job of explaining our history, our rich history and culture in Africa. My dad took it upon himself um, to teach me uh, and really instill in me a sense of dignity of, from, um, about coming from Africa. And that really helped me have a positive outlook on who I am, right? As a black person, as an individual, I had a sense of dignity um, knowing that my ancestors are from the continent, continent of Africa, whereas a lot of other African Americans I encountered, unfortunately, had a negative opinion about being of African descent, right? And I'm sure we've all encountered those folks who will say they're this and that and, and you know, try to identify with every other racial group except Black because they were taught that we were inferior, right? So yeah, to his point, it's really important that we educate ourselves about our history um, because that helps give us, give us a foundation and really um, work towards having a more positive outlook on who we are as individuals because that way um, the outside world will not be able to shake us and shake our confidence in ourselves. Wonderful. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the next topics I'm going to combine two. One is about black communities and successful black uh, individuals. For a fact, we know it to be true that the worst, well, worst maintained communities in America that I know of is black communities. And um, for us to succeed in life, people of color, black people, we have to move into the white community to say, oh, now we're successful because the black community that we move from, unfortunately, represents failure or an inferiority uh, living standards. And um, I don't know how to tackle this with a tactful way to say that uh, things can change, but the crime rate, as you know, is higher in our black community versus other communities. And a lot of, of us, I'm one of them, we move away from our black communities in order to improve our living standards, supposedly, only into communities and in some instances that does not accept us. I'll give you an example in my life. I moved in a community that had a swimming pool, four swimming pools, golf course, very nice community. And across me were, were my neighbors and they saw me living there for a period of time. They never reached out and never spoke to me obviously I'm the black person in the community. Until one event occurred with my wife and the neighbor's wife across the street. And she, my wife came home so excited. She said, honey, I met our neighbor across the street. They're such nice people. I said, you mean the one that's been over across the street for two years? She said, yeah, the kids kind of spoke to our kids and they kind of had a very good, meaningful uh, a meeting. I said, wow, that sounds exciting. She said, well, how do you feel about it? I said, well, We've been over here in this house for two years. They've seen us for two years. They looked at us for two years. Never did they reach out to speak to us. And I told my wife, said, okay, here's the deal. I'll wait two years from now before I, before I decide to speak to them. Because I am not going to be looked upon as being inferior in any instances in any way. So two years from now, I'll speak to them. Because they had every opportunity when you and I tried to speak to them. They chose not to. So part of that 
issue that we have in this country, I believe, is that being in certain parts of America, we are distinguishing ourselves to be successful, only to still be rejected. So let me close up and see if there's anybody that want to comment about it. Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I, you're right. Uh, a lot of times people in our community, we do end up leaving the black community in, in search of greener pastures right outside of our communities. And there's a lot that goes into that historically, of course, as we know, um, black communities were thriving actually, right even after the emancipation, right, of our ancestors. A lot of black communities in America were thriving. Communities, even though we had been oppressed and enslaved for hundreds of years, we came out thriving uh, post-slavery. There were uh, Black Wall Street, which was Tulsa, Oklahoma, was a very successful, thriving Black community. Um, one of my ancestors, his name was called Free Frank. You can Google him. He's actually in the museum in the Smithsonian. And he started a Black community, I believe it was in Illinois, and it was called New Philadelphia. And there are some historical um, activities going on there, some archaeologists digging up some of the remains there. And it was a very successful, thriving Black community. And he actually was a pioneer because he allowed integration. All right. But what happened was a lot of these Black communities were strategically attacked by white people and as well as by the governments and by other private enterprises. They attacked these Black communities in various ways, economically, for example, in New Philadelphia, it was on the train stop. Well, they decided to move the train so that it no longer ran through that black town because they did not want, they didn't feel comfortable seeing successful black people, right? As we know, Tulsa, Oklahoma was bombed and attacked and um, the black folks in that, that area were killed and chased out of there, all right? So a lot of times, unfortunately, our communities were successful, but then they were attacked and strategically um, dismantled, all right? And so we know historically a lot of things have happened for, our, for us. And so unfortunately now um, our communities are a place where a lot of us flee and there's not as much economic opportunities in our communities. For example, in Detroit, that used to be the manufacturing hub for the automobile industry. But then those jobs were exported overseas, which left a, an economic vacuum in Detroit. Right, because Detroit used to be a very uh, attractive city to relocate to, but now after all those um, automobile jobs relocated to China and to Mexico, um, it left a lot of our people in these inner cities in some very destitute situations, right? So that's the historical aspect, but I would say a solution which we could take forever to unpack, I think is that we do need to start looking at relocating to black communities and investing our economic our economics there um everyone uses the example of atlanta and that is a good example you know of a lot of there are a lot of black people who are doctors and lawyers and entertainers and you know now it's like the black hollywood now right tyler perry has his huge studio there which is employing hundreds if not thousands of people and bringing economic power to atlanta Right, so that's an example of a place where you see successful black people investing in the black community. And if we could replicate that, you know, and of course Atlanta's not perfect, no city is, but if we could replicate that um, in other majority black cities or historically majority black cities, then I think that would uh, really help us and help our future generations. Thank you so much. Uh, Valerie, I'm going to put you on the spot because you've been a banker. <laughs> you know all too well how discriminatory behaviors mm -hmm. have been used to keep the Black community from improving the way that many homeowners wanted to invest in their property. Mm -hmm. uh, the redlining that we spoke of earlier, I'm sure you're familiar with that. If That's you want good. to kind of comment, you're certainly up, up to you, but I'm not trying to put you on the spot intentionally, but... <laughs> I think okay, I'm have... retired now. I'll talk. <laughs> oh, you retired. Okay, <laughs> be gone. <laughs> okay. Oh, I, I, yeah. I mean, yeah. I've experienced some things firsthand that I, you know, were clearly, you know, they're they just 
totally racial, motiv racially motivated. Um, I can give you one example in, um, you know, working for one of the mortgage companies. Um, they were reviewing, um, you know, our upper, you know, uh, supervisors were reviewing accounts. Oh, these people have had this account for several years. Let's look at reducing the rate. Rates it lower. Wait, what? I uh, happened to be some people that I was acquainted with through my younger brother. So contact him, get the lower rate. One of the, the uh, local managers decided to bump that rate up. And it was like, I don't believe you're doing this to them. You know, they've been, they've been clients for years and they've been told to lower this rate, but you want to raise it. You want to lower it, but not as much as, as um, it was suggested that they qualify for. And I just took it on myself to call them, call the client. I said, look, don't accept anything lower than this because this is what you're approved for. And I just told them, I said, this is what you're approved for. So when they came in, you know, and they looked at the rate, they said, nope, we're not taking it, you know? And, and I'm sure the manager was upset, but I just told them, I said, look, don't take anything lower than this. This is your approval. This is what you're approved for. Don't take it. But the sad part is, I don't know how many other people they did this too. I just happened to know this one because there was someone I knew, recognized the rate and got to look at the file and saw, oh, wait a minute. No, you're not going to do this. But, you know, and this thing, it happens daily. It doesn't just, you know, it's just not a one, a one off situation. It happens daily. It happens all the time. As far as, you know, when you qualify for a loan, you get the higher rate or, you know, if you don't know and understand you know, finance, you'll get the higher rate or don't understand the power of your uh, credit score or, you know, the power of your credit history and your job stability being you may not understand that, you know, you have a right to demand a better rate. You have a right to say, hey, this isn't acceptable. And believe me, if you turn them down, <laughs> if you turn them down, they will reconsider or someone else may. But um, sometimes we just have to know, you know, the strength of our power and what we have to offer. Because, you know, many times we don't and we'll accept less than because this is what they told us. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, Mr. Luca or Mr. Madison, you guys care to comment on the fact that uh, our communities uh, are typically the worst communities of all and it's not personally the responsibility anyone in many circumstances it is made to be that way because of the inferiority complex they don't want black people to live in nice communities so do you guys have any comments you would like to share about that yeah i've got um, a couple of experiences uh that i'd like to share quickly uh and and it it, it has to do obviously historically uh post-slavery with segregation, Jim Crow, and all of the financial redlining that Valerie knows all about uh, that took place. Uh, we were living in a cage. What happened in the early, uh, in, in after the civil rights movement in the 60s and, and the 70s, when some of those fair housing barriers were struck down, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, we, who were upwardly mobile wanted to move to places where two things happened. One, our asset values appreciated. And two, we had access to better community resources, schools, uh, parks, safe neighborhoods, et cetera. The black community itself was, was not always a, an, a, a, a place of crime and, and, and a, a, a negative place to, to live. Uh, we just want it better and, and everybody always wants better. Uh, and um, what, what happened was two things. One, as black people moved into better communities, I'll say better, um, not, uh, it, it, they happen to be white, uh, there's a phenomenon that that economically is is uh, documented. If the number of black people in that community reached about 10 percent 
what followed quickly was white flight. <laughs> so what was previously an all white community, once it became as much as 10% black, they, uh, it shifted quickly to a majority black community. And the very same house that you paid $400,000 for in the black community uh, was worth $600,000 in an all white community. Uh, the, the, the value of that property uh, did not appreciate once that community started to shift to be a black co community. Two things that I've ex experienced uh, along those lines is uh, that one, uh, a friend of mine, when I asked what happened to our community, the local community that I grew up in, um, uh, and, and he said, the problem is, Roger, you left. Uh, and, and he said, I don't mean you specifically. He said, the best of our community left. What, what the Black community was all about when I grew up, we had lawyers, doctors, uh, entrepreneurs, businessmen, folk who owned groceries. It, everything that existed in the white community existed in our community, but on a much smaller scale. The community was safe. Parents looked out for their neighbors, children, and, and, and all of that. But the most successful among us, the most ambitious, the most upwardly mobile, left that community. And, and what we left that community with were the le least educated, the least employable, and, and those whose situation was horrible, even when we were there, we just took care of them. But when we left, nobody else took care of them. And, and so, so, so that's the phenomenon of the quote, black community that, that I've experienced as, as we moved. And, and, and the interesting thing, Tyrone, as you, you were talking about your neighbors, what uh, my wife and I have done, uh, I, I worked for the IBM Corporation uh, throughout my career before I retired. And I worked for IBM when those three letters stood for I've been moved. We, we, we've moved 13 times. And what my children who, who, who grew up uh, with us, obviously, uh, know how to do better than anything else is to meet strangers and make new friends. So whenever I moved into a new community and almost everywhere we moved when, when I was working for IBM was a predominantly white community. The first thing I did after the movers got all of our stuff moved in is that I walked across the street and down the street and introduced myself to all of my neighbors and, and told them we had two children and, and asked them about the schools and whatnot. And then I went back home. Now, um, they stayed home and I stayed home. Um, they didn't invite me to their backyard barbecues and I didn't invite them to mine but they knew who I was and I knew who they were and we'd speak when we were out cutting the grass and we were friendly, but, um, but, 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 but we were strangers in the same neighborhood, so to speak, after that initial introduction. But, but, but I just wanted them to know that, 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 that they, uh, they had a neighbor who took just as much pride in this neighborhood as they did. And, um, and, and, and once, we, we got past that, everything was fine. Now, here's a story that, that, that shocked me uh, more than any other. The community we live in now, when we moved here, our children were all grown. Our neighbors on, on, on all of our neighbors had children who were from three or four years old up to teenagers. They all had children, we didn't. Uh, so we watched these neighbors' children grow up. We moved here in 1991. So by, the, by 2008, when Barack Obama was uh, running for president, we had been here for a while. Uh, and I put a Barack Obama sign in my front yard. The first thing that happened is it disappeared overnight. <laughs> and I put a second one in my yard and the second one disappeared. And then the third one, I put right up next to my front door. And I said, let's see how close you're gonna come to my front door to remove this sign. Well, it stayed. No one <laughs> ventured that close to my front door to remove the sign. However, my next door neighbor, we were 
talking across our backyards. Uh, my next door neighbor said to me, Roger, I am absolutely shocked. This is a white neighbor. I cannot believe that you are a Barack Obama supporter. I said, I beg your pardon. She said, you've been here with us for 20 years. We thought you were just like us. <laughs> I mean, they, I mean, and they said that, they, they, I mean, they weren't apologizing for saying it. They, they were just surprised that somehow or another, I didn't get the memo that I- <laughs> Or the invite to the barbecue. <laughs> or the invitation to the barbecue. <laughs> And, uh, but, but that actually happened. And um, shortly after that, they moved. <laughs> but but, but, but um, it, it's interesting that in these communities where we move to, um, uh, they don't know how to receive us. So uh, I, I don't leave it to them to make that decision. Uh, we're active in the local Democratic Party. We, I, I go to school board meetings and stuff like that. So, so I, even though we don't have any children in the schools and it, uh, but what happens to us uh, in this neighborhood now that we're retired and my taxes keep going up be, because the, the values are going up and the school board keeps uh, imposing new levies uh, to, to, to raise our, our taxes. That happens, when that happens in a black community, a poor black community, People who've been there for years get priced out of their own community. They get taxed out of their own community and gentrification sets in. And then folks ask the question, well, how come this neighborhood is so much better now that white folk are coming back? Uh, and that, that annoys me when I hear that. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, just annoys the heck out of me, but uh, uh, there, there's nothing inherently wrong with our neighborhoods. Uh, it's the economic, structure that that works against those of us who are not upwardly mobile beautiful sir you are <laughs> i am grateful that you're on here today i really am you you are i've known you some years back and even better now that we have reacquainted ourselves uh by the way i want to welcome one of my co-workers lisa i see that you're in the house and uh i know you on mute but uh we're are engaged in this discussion about are black people really inferior and I think it's a discussion that we need to have so if you care to chime in or when you feel appropriately to say something Lisa I'm leaving it up to you okay thank you Tyrone <laughs> and how are you doing today by the way I'm doing well thank you very good Okay, if anybody else care to chime in on the uh, question uh, discussion at this point, we're talking about uh, having to live in a white community and the way that the demise of the black community happens to be, you certainly are going to do so. But we will proceed with the last part of the discussion. So I'll momentarily wait to see if anybody else care to make a comment. I, I just wanted to say that, uh, oh, does someone else want to say something? Go on, Anton. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, Mr. Madison definitely hit the nail on the head, right? That what happened was the, the creme de la creme of the black community, the black folks who were uh, economically growing, who uh, were the most educated, those who had the most upward mobility were the ones who really uh, left, right? It was kind of like you, you skim it off the top of the pot when the pot's simmering and that good creme de la creme of the black community were the ones who ended up leaving. And I think the same thing is sort of reflected in, in Africa. Maybe our Nigerian brothers here could confirm, but I've heard that the same thing happens in Nigeria, that a lot of the most educated Nigerians, the most upwardly mobile Nigerians tend to be the ones who leave in search of um, better opportunities elsewhere, which is understandable. But then what happens, unfortunately, is that it leaves those who did not have an opportunity to leave, it leaves them you know, in a more destitute situation, right? Because like, for example, here in the States, when the upwardly mobile black folks left the majority black communities, they took with them their economic power, their resources, and their, their, their knowledge, they call it brain drain, right? Uh, there's a brain drain that happens because, uh, you know, they leave. So yeah, I just wanted to 
concur with Matt, Mr. Madison on that. And I also want to confirm what Mr. Alton said. Uh, that is the exact experience here in Nigeria. Uh, it happens here in Nigeria as well. I just threw like one like this away. That's the only person they looking for me. Go on, please, Luca. All right. Thank you very much, sir, uh, Mr. Tyrone. Uh, well, the situation here is, is, is a bit different. It's quite different from uh, the US over there because what we, we live as black people around here, but still, we still have those people who feel they are better than, they are better than those uh, who don't have much. Uh, when it comes to uh, finance, like uh, the economic power, those those in authority, the feel the those who are the lower level, they are better than them. So they when they go to glass house, they forget where they come from, which is the roof, the place that build them up. They always abandon that place. They abandon the grassroots where they come from. So. Is, is a situation we, we also experience, experience here in Nigeria. Like, uh, like my experience and what I've been passing through in a couple of uh, months now, I think uh, I shared my experience with uh, Mr. Tyron uh, some two days back. Where I am now, we produce the largest oil in Nigeria. The largest oil in Nigeria, I'm a graduate of medical biochemistry. I graduated 2017. I've served Nigeria as a national call. I've served Nigeria. And as a youth, after coming out from school, I've, I'm expected to like the government, or the leaders, the governors, put us into a, a good working environment. But like what I was sharing with Mr. Tyron said, the situation here is very terrible. As graduates, as a people who have everything around us, it's just like we have everything. We have water, a drum of water around in, in our own house, but we have soap entering our eyes. That is the experience here in Nigeria. And those that have the opportunity to assess the wealth of the environment, to assess the wealth of the community, as a mass it, as embezzled it to themselves alone, making those that does not have the opportunity to feel very wretched, neglected, and abandoned in the streets. So like what I was sharing with Mr. Tyron, I said, it's very terrible here. Like I'm seeking for job. Like I have opportunity where I can take my CV to, to the government, to the oil company where they can employ me freely, but the opportunity is not there. We've been denied those rights. Even our own people, our own black people are maltreating us yet. So it is it's, it's, it's have to do with the mindset. It has to do with the mindset and the values we create for ourselves. Because if we don't have these values, like what Mr. Uh, uh, Marcy said, he said their parents taught them when they, when they were much younger. So to handle, to face situations, to face some encounters, but the Nigeria situation is, is quite different. The, the Nigeria here in Africa situation is, is totally different. We are still being oppressed by our own people. Those that feel they've climbed to the top and they leave the ladder behind for those who are coming up not to get to that stage where they are. So it's a very terrible situation. And I, I, I would also want to use this medium to also appeal that if this uh, organization can come up with programs where we can, uh, people are passing through it. A, a, a lot, yeah. I think in the last last few months or last three months, we 
percent suicide because our people, the young people, are taking their lives here because they have no hope. They are in the street and they have no hope of tomorrow, what tomorrow will be. So they are taking their life. And it has to do with self value, self mor morals, which I have in my own little capacity, I've said for myself. And I've looked at society differently from what some persons are looking at uh, in a very broad way. That I, I have, that there is a dream that I have that no matter what, as I'm going to persevere, there is a better tomorrow for me. That there is a better days ahead of me. That is why I am I'm so sure that I would go through the, the caliber of persons here. I am the youngest. And it's a rare, rare opportunity and rare privilege for me to also come to come here and uh, for the Nigerian people and for my people as uh, the young people here in Nigeria. So thank you very much. Uh, this is my little experience. Thank you very much. I also want to welcome to the room uh, Stella, one of my friend and family member, I would say. Stella, if you we may speak, uh, she lives in Rwanda. Uh, how are you? You doing okay? Hi, hi. How are you, everybody? <laughs> yeah, it's so nice for you to join us. Yes. Sorry, and I came late. That's, don't worry about it. We have an Infinix Hot 110i. Uh, if you turn your video on, we would appreciate it, please. I think I know you, but uh, I'm trying to recall you. Can you see me? Yeah, no, I see you, yes. Uh huh. And there's another okay. uh, individual, Infinix uh, Hot 10i. Uh, if you will turn your video on. Listen, so we're going to go to the last part of the discussion, and uh, this is specifically in America. I don't know about Africa, but uh, we certainly might have some similarities. In America, the educational system is a critical criteria for how you succeed in this society, no question about it. But, and to that point, our Black ancestors pull their resources together to build colleges to further advance the intellect of individuals who needed that type of advancement. But with that is the development of the HBCUs. These are black colleges, colleges across the country. Uh, I have noted in my experiences, and you guys may have different experiences, but in today's society in America, uh, when black parents want their kids allegedly to get the best education, they send them specifically to white institutions because black institutions are feared to have inferiority teachers. The concept itself doesn't give their child a competitiveness or they give them the education that they think their child deserves. So as a result, the HBCUs are overlooked by a lot of black parents. And I will share a personal experience I had when I was working on the military base in Virginia. One of my coworkers, she was an exceptional achiever. She had a daughter that wanted to get a law degree. And at the time I recommended a university, she looked at me in an appalling way and said, are you helping me? And I said, what's wrong with that university? That's a black college. I'm not gonna send my kid to a black college. I said, what's wrong with the black college? I want my kid to have a better education. I was shocked at her approach to that and her, in the way she thought about it but she was speaking in the way in which she felt about it. She felt in order for her child, who was very smart, obviously, uh, to have the best advantage, she or he must go to a white institution. And I think that is part of the inferiority complex that we have in America, that we cannot trust our professionals or our professionals are not professionals, if that makes sense. So I'm opening up the discussion for that for, for you guys. If whoever cared to chime in, please do so. Uh, Tyrone, this is uh, uh, an interesting subject that I've, I've thought about an, an, an awful lot. My, my mother is, is a graduate of an HBCU. And during the 60s, in the middle of the civil rights movement, 
during uh, the long, hot summers, and, and, and we in the South were visited by so-called freedom riders, uh, of well-meaning white folk from the North who came down South to help us out. And uh, among them was a, a, a young white college professor who I uh, encountered when I was 16 years old. And he said to me, Roger, you seem like a very bright young man. What do you plan to do with yourself um, as you graduate from high school? I said, I am, um, I'm, I'm planning to go to college. And he said, uh, where are you planning to go? And I said, well, my mother went to Virginia State University. That's what it's called today. And um, my, my dad uh, is, is, is um, uh, partial to Hampton. And I've visited um, um, Winston-Salem um, uh, down in North Carolina. And he looked at me very paternalistically. And, and he said, Roger, um, I, I don't mean any disrespect by this, he said, but as bright as you are, so here we are, uh, um, we, we're on the verge of <clears throat> some breakthroughs in this civil rights movement. And, and there are uh, many white institutions, larger institutions that uh, are beginning to accept black students. And I would encourage you to consider going to one of those schools. And he said, uh, I hope this doesn't offend you. He said, but I've visited a lot of HBCUs in the work that I do. And most of them are little more than advanced high schools. That's what he said to me. Look, I, and I, it, it just shocked me. Uh, long story short, um, I took his advice and I went to the George Washington University in Washington, DC. And when I got there, I encountered the shock of my life because I had grown up in all black schools my entire life. And I was absolutely unprepared to matriculate at the level of education that the George Washington University uh, uh, was operating at. My college classmates, were uh, better prepared. The first English paper that I wrote came back with more red marks on it than, 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 than the black ink that I used to write it with. Uh, I, I didn't write well. I, 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 I was not accustomed to the lecture method of learning. Uh, I was not prepared for the blue books. Those of you who are old Noela. enough to remember blue books. Noela. Noela. <laughs> Where, where the professor uh, walked into the classroom, wrote three questions on the board, and he said, you can answer any two of these questions, and I expect you to write 10 pages on each one of your answers. I was not prepared to learn nor to uh, <laughs> respond that way. Long story short, I flunked out of George Washington University, spent seven years in the Air Force and went back to George Washington University and graduated with a 4.3, not 4.3, a 3.3 grade point average uh, after uh, factoring in all those Ds that I got when they flunked me out. Uh, and um, because between those seven years, I learned how to learn. And that's what I taught my kids that going to college is about learning how to learn. And many of the HBCUs uh, simply don't have access to all of the resources. Their libraries are not as extensive. Uh, their laboratories are not as well funded. Their, uh, uh, their professors are not as well endowed to go, go off to sabbaticals and, and, and explore the world to prepare themselves better to teach their students, et cetera, et cetera. It's a question of resources. Uh, many of the HBCUs are much better resourced today than they were in 1964 when I went off to college, but, but there is still a huge gap. And um, 
it, it is a function of that 250 years of slavery and the 100 years of Jim Crow when there was no place else for my mother to go to school after high school, but to an HBCU. And, um, and, and today, uh, many of them have not been able to recover from that disadvantage. Beautiful. I have a, I have a, I have a, question, a question to Roger Tyrone. Beautiful, Lisa. Thank you for chiming in. Go ahead. Hi, Roger. This is Lisa. I have a question for you. Do you feel that way about Howard University? Because I I just don't have that. I, I don't have that understanding that they lack resources and that they. So are you speaking of all um, um, historically black colleges or oh, absolutely not? The, the um, Howard is uh, uh, probably the best of of of, of the best. And, and, and um, uh, but many of them are struggling financially. Even Howard was uh, in financial straits just a couple of years ago, trying to fund the level of quality of education that they want. One of the things that I've done, I've written to people like Michael Eric Dyson and, 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 um, and, um, um, what's his name, uh, C Cornell West. And I've asked them, why don't you go to HBCUs? You guys are, are, are highly regarded and respected intellectuals. Uh, our HBCUs could benefit from you. And Michael Eric Dyson said to me, one, they can't pay me. Two, if I went there, I could not spend anywhere near the time that I currently am able to spend doing research, research, I would have to spend all of my time in the classroom. And, and pretty soon uh, you, you get out of touch if that's the only place that you function. As you know, the, 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 the uh, axiom among college professors in predominantly white universities is publish or perish. Uh, they, uh, they give their professors the resources and the time. And if, and if you don't publish, you perish. Uh, that demonstrates your level of contribution to the university. I didn't understand that until the second time I went to George Washington University. Most of my professors wrote the textbooks that they were using in the classroom. They were not teaching from somebody else's uh, work uh, because of the research and the publications that they were able to do. So you go into the bookstore in the George Washington University and, and, and for the classwork, what you find is that the professors that are teaching the classes, it's their books that you have to buy to, uh, to, to participate in, in the class. Uh, that shocked me. Of course, that was back in the 70s. Nobody uses books anymore. Everybody else does things digitally uh, nowadays. But um, uh, it's just like Tyrone and, and, and the others of us were talking about our community. The best of our best uh, always excel. And that applies to Howard University and, and other. Uh, if I'm familiar with, I'm very active in UNCF, for example. And um, uh, there are very good schools and there are others. Um, and, and the very good schools are as good as any school you, you can go to. Thank you. Stella, you wanted to comment? Stella, do you care to comment? Okay, uh, anybody else care to chime in? Uh, Mr. Mr. Madison, you are a superb person. I thank you for being on. And we're talking about the inferiority complex perception that black institutions, and we see it's not that they do not want to be as great or better than white institutions, but dollars have determined how well and successful our institutions are. And you see the uh, budget that is before Congress now on the make, America, make America back good again, a better again. Part of that is to fund the HBCUs. 
they realized that the HBCUs have been underfunded and thereby, to your point, Mr. Madison, they can't do the things that other uh, universities have done who had the freedom and the financial resources to do that. I think Tico Thomas has their hands up to comment. Hello, would you unmute yourself, please? Tico? Yes, sir. Hi. Hey, hi, how are you? Very good, my friend. I'm, I'm very well, too. Uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I came in a bit late. Don't uh, worry about that. Yes, uh, uh, but I got, I think you had handled maybe over 50% of, uh, of the discussion. Yeah, 50% of the discussion. Uh, okay. uh, but uh, I think I can share something uh, on the insight I have in Uganda here. Uh, about uh, what is happening concerning uh, if you in a complex. Okay. So in Uganda here, uh, it's a big problem really. Uh, and this happens in a way that, uh, you know, when, when we have the white folks come in Uganda here, uh, they, they are given really special attention when a, when a white man or a white woman walks in, you walk in together, you find uh, the reception or the front desk manager would, uh, would actually prefer to give attention to a white man or a white lady and, 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 and ignore you. So <laughs> it's a big problem here. And uh, Yes, I, I, I can also share actually a similar story with what my brother shared from Nigeria. Uh, he talked about uh, classes here in Uganda. Here we have classes. We have classes of those who are really rich, uh, who have money. So such people who have money, uh, of course, when they walk in a place, they would, uh, yeah get serious attention and you doesn't have money sometimes when you walk in a place uh you will not be treated with much uh, with much 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 dignity and, and respect so that's a problem we are, we have in uganda here that that's briefly really what i can say uh, about this discussion thank you guys for for giving me this opportunity to share this maybe i'll share along as we proceed yeah thank you very thank much you. thank you any other comments about the disparity or the inferiority complex is created from the fact that our institutions are funded differently and thereby the better education obviously will go into the white uh, institution. Any other comments about that? I just wanted to say that, it, you know, in agreement with you all that it is about funding ultimately, right, and education. So, you know, where do we go from here is my question, right? So we need to secure enough funding um, in order to, you know, improve our educational systems, our schools, our HBCUs, um, maybe even fund uh, African-American students to have the opportunity to uh, visit the motherland, all of these enriching activities and opportunities. So yeah, it starts with funding, um, but where do we go from here, right? How do we achieve that funding uh, where do we pull that those resources from? Because if we can't get the funding, then, you know, that's like baseline. If we can't obtain the funding, then we're not going to be able to, um, to move up. We're not going to be able to improve our circumstances. I, I love what you just posed to us. Um, I put a statement out in the forum and, and it pertains to those who were ordering t-shirts. And the comment was, if we can believe together, together we can do many things. So it starts with our believing that we can collectively come together. And um, unfortunately, Naya Lacey from, uh, John is not on today. But uh, you guys and Mr. Madison, I've sent you a copy of the song, Africans Unite by Mr. Lemon Black. Uh, a movement has to start and take place within us, uh, individually as well as collectively. Uh, that being the case, uh, we are going to put out a song, Mr. Lemon Black will do the song and Mr. Madison, you've heard the monologue. 
And the song will be entitled Climate Change. We're not talking about the weather and stuff like that, climate. We're talking about globally, the climate of how we people of color are disrespected or not respected. And if we start to insert into the minds of the people who have looked down upon us, that we are inferior to make them realize that we're not. And I think we all have in our own individual way been fighting this inferiority complex. But the other word, the superiority complex has been more uh, prevailing in our world than our inferiority complex. So we humble ourselves to try to be white, to be like them, and only to have them to come across the street as Mr. Madison, in your case, is I didn't know you thought that way. Uh, because perceptionally, we are to uh, stimulate ourselves in such ways that uh, we, as I stated about the colorblind concept, we, we, we remove ourselves from being black in order to be accepted by the whites. And uh, that's no way for us to live. Um, speaking of the motherland, uh, I said in one of my comments, if you guys read it, maybe you did not, that Africa has the potential to be the most powerful continent on the earth. No question about it. You guys got resources there that other countries, families and individuals have become wealthy over, but yet and still the Africans are still suffering. That has to change. So maybe the change can be with us individually coming together collectively, but the biggest and boldest move that can be made is Africa come together as a continent, not in these little individual uh, countries that was decided back in 1884 with the Berlin Conference when a group of white guys got together and decided how they were gonna partial off parts of Africa to the various countries. But if Africans can come together as a whole and the song by Lemon Black, Africans oh, Unite, no. if that can happen, everything else will fall into play. But obviously oh, we're no. talking about a world that does not exist. And maybe I'm in a dream world saying that the world can exist that way. Maybe not in my lifetime. And you guys heard Dr. King, if you can remember his speech, I've been to the mountaintop and I looked over and I seen the promised land. I thought about that speech and many of my thoughts. And when he said he looked over and seen the promised land, if you're at the top of the mountain in America, that's where the dream took place. He wasn't looking at Europe, I wouldn't think so. He wasn't looking at the northern part of Canada, nor was he looking um, South, uh, South America, Central America. When he said, I looked over and I seen the promised land, that, in my opinion, which was not clarified in his speech, was the continent of Africa. And I don't think he was wrong in that speech. It's just that he didn't say, I looked over and I seen Africa as being the promised land. Africa is the promised land. We know that for a fact. Uh, even the name itself, the first original name of Africa, says that it is the home of the Garden of Eden. It is the home of mankind. And unfortunately, we have been, uh, um, in the academic world, uh, Europeans have successfully staged us to think less of ourselves than who we are. But God think more of us than obviously the Europeans do. And I think we just have to come together and... Uh, Anton, what you had talked about can happen. I believe it will happen. And maybe not in my lifetime. But if we consistently believe something, it will happen. It can happen. But anyways, let me be quiet because I can talk too much at time. Please forgive me. Somebody else might want to chime in, please. Tyrone, I, I, I have a perspective on that comment about the promised land. And, um, and, and I, I, I'll cast it in two frames, um, one frame is this. Uh, this gathering today is the promised land. We are the promised land that Martin Luther King was looking forward to. Our journey, the conversations, our intellectual uh, uh, enlightenment, our outreach and connection with our brothers and sisters uh, in, in Africa, that is 
the promised land. We are a part of the promise that he foresaw. Now, how we make that promised land better is, 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 is the other thing that, that, that I want to uh, uh, just kind of reflect on. And here's how I've reflected on that. There, there are three options we have um, collectively, segregation, integration, or, or uh, um, what's, what's, what's the other word? Um, assimilation. Uh, and assimilation is where you give up your identity. Uh, you just become something that you're not, uh, whether you do it uh, voluntarily or it's done to you involuntarily. And, and we have experience with that involuntary assimilation as slaves here in this country. Uh, the other options are segregation and integration. Uh, we are often, uh, I'm often um, in discussions about comparisons between us and Asians, us and the Jewish people, us and some of the uh, Latin uh, brothers and sisters who've come to this country and, and, and talk about how they unify better and, and, and have more effective outcomes on some occasions than, than we do. And, um, and, 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 and in the case of the Asians and the, and the Jewish population, they have chosen to integrate. They've not given up their identity but they've chosen to integrate on their terms. In New York City, the uh, high performing high schools, the, the selective enrollment high schools where you have to test to get into these high schools where the best public education in New York City is taken, but is dominated by Asians. They have chosen to make that their arena of competition and, and they don't want to hear anything about affirmative action or social uh, uh, adjustment. Uh, it's merit-based entry into those high schools only, but that's how the Asians have chosen to integrate. My daughter went to Berkeley. The incoming class at Berkeley when she left there was over one third Asian. They have chosen to integrate into our society at the best university on the West Coast. Uh, so what we have to choose is whether we want to segregate and by segregating, uh, and, and many folk are asking us to return to segregation. And I will tell you, I grew up in a 100% segregated community and, 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 and I don't wanna go back there. Um, uh, as Moms Mabley used to say, uh, the good old days, what good old days? I was there and, 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 and where were they at? They were no good old days. What we're living in now are, is much better than, than, than those good old days ever were. However, we have to choose how we want to leverage our specific intellect and strengths. And they are many. Black folk have excelled in every arena of performance there is political, we've had a black president. Social, uh, we've dominated TV and entertainment. Uh, athletics, we've dominated sports. We can dominate wherever we choose to uh, contribute. So what happened was the very best black athletes went and dominated in the, the National Football League and in the, the, the Major League Baseball and, and, and a victim of all of that is the Black Baseball League uh, failed. The victim of all of that is today. Today, there are only four working NFL professional football players from HBCUs. All of the very best NFL football players go to another place to train and prepare themselves, but we're starting to get involved in ownership. We're starting to get involved in head coaching and, and leadership and, and, and management. So we have to choose how we want to integrate. It's not an either or. 
We, we build on the strength of our HBCUs. We build on the strength of the black communities where we grew up and learned all these values that we're sharing today. And then we choose where to go put, uh, compete, whether it's a Fortune 500 organization or whether it's politics or whether it's athletics or, or entertainment. The hands down number one best comedian in all the world today is Dave Chappelle. He walked away from $50 million when they were asking him to be a buffoon and a coon. And now he's competing on his own terms in the entertainment world. And, and, and that's just a, a few of the examples that I, I would say. So uh, you're looking at the promised land. It's right here on the screen. Take a screenshot. You see it. It's right in front of you. And, and what we have to do is pass that promise on to our children and our grandchildren and make sure they appreciate what we've been through and, 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 and how rich what we have learned and have become is as we pass it along to them. Forgive me for the sermon. No, thank you, sir. I am honored, and I'm sure everybody else is honored by your presence. Uh, I don't, if anybody else cared to chime in, it's, it's a hard act to follow everybody. You're certainly welcome to do so. Anton, you seem to be engaged So what? Yeah, I agree. I was just going to say to add to that is that we can certainly dominate any field. As a matter of fact, Nigerians are coming over here and actually dominating Asians in the academic field already. We see it, right? So um, Black folks are dominating education in a lot of ways in, in the form of Nigerians and Ghanaians coming over here to the United States. And um, outperforming their Asian counterparts even in a lot of these universities. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with culture though, right? Because I know Nigerian culture is similar to a lot of those East Asian cultures in that they place a high premium on education, a very high premium on education. So when they come over here, they really take advantage of the opportunities. And so I think immigrants in particular um, come over here and really thrive. Um, in the educational field. Um, Asians happen to be one of the prominent immigration, immigrant groups that come over here and really um, you know, dominate the uh, higher education, but they're not alone, right? Because a lot of Nigerians, as I said, and Ghanaians and other Africans who immigrate here are really outperforming um, the Asians and the white folks in higher education as well. So I think that's a mindset thing. And I'm wondering if, if as African-Americans, we can try to um, adopt some of those mindsets, right? To really try to take advantage of higher education. I know a lot of it has to do with funding and how a lot of it has to do with circumstances that we grow up in, in the inner cities and things like that. But, um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to add to uh, what Madison said. Uh, everyone, um this has been one of the most exciting days of my life. And I must tell you, uh, last night I was very, uh, I don't know, a little hesitant about today. I feared that it would turn to be something uh, unproductive because of the title of what we were seeking to do today. But in my heart, I believe that this has been the most productive day in the many years I've lived to be one of those days. I will not forget. Uh, the comments that each of you guys have shared and brought forth your spirit. Uh, anybody who should be blessed uh, and with the patience to listen to our discussion, they are going to be uplifted, no question about it. Um, so there are things that's going to happen in our world that we live in. And uh, we have people on in this promised land environment Thank you, Mr. Madison, for telling us that, and God bless you. Uh, I've always been a fan of yours, and sir, I will always be that way. And that will not change, I can promise you. Um, but I am very appreciative of everybody who came in here today. I, I, I guess I'm summarizing today because at some point we have to end our love for each other. And this is actually love that we have between us to talk and, and share our experiences. So we each can grow and become better people at who we are trying to be. And we need to connect to our sisters and brothers, Africans and African-Americans. Please 
I do ask everyone to reach out and get to know somebody who you do not know, but make them a part of your family, like Stella and people I met uh, in different parts of Africa, Luca, Lemon. and I met a lot of wonderful people and continue to meet wonderful people. And I am blessed by that. Anton, you're a blessing as well. So uh, guys, I, I know this has been a beautiful meeting to everyone. It has been to me. I've learned a lot again, and I thank everybody for enriching my day. And uh, if anybody have any closing comments, please uh, do so. I have two words. Thank you. Thank you is my thank you to you, sir. <laughs> anybody else care to uh, chime in? Well, thank you from, from my hand. I want to thank Mr. Tyron for coming up with such a brilliant idea of bringing people of Africa, uh, 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 those in America, and trying to gap, you are, you are bridging, you are closing the gap. That is, you are, you are building a bridge between those in America and uh, the Blacks in America and those in Nigeria, uh, in Africa in particular. I want to thank you for this opportunity and for meeting a lot of people, a lot of Africans, and Black Americans, uh, African living Ameri America, I want to thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a real one. And uh, I hope this continues. And then time to time, uh, I hope we'll get to get more of this. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, listen, we are together. It's not just me. We are building the bridge. And I thank you as well. <laughs> Stella, do you care to comment? I know you are there. Yes, I would like to Hi, Stella. Uh, you might be trying to speak, but we're not hearing something from you. Um, I would like to say something. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, I think that you've all discussed about how we are strong in every, in every field. Let it be sports, let it be politics, let it be education and everything. So what is left now is we have to have confidence. The problem with most Africans don't have confidence. That is where the problem is. So if we have, can get some confidence, we can approach everything, we can approach everybody, we can do whatever we want to do. We don't have to have that inferiority complex. Beautiful. Absolutely. Beautiful. Yes. Why would we have inferiority complex? We are educated, we can work, we can do everything. So why would we think that whites are better than us? Why? Why do we accept that? Why do we accept that? We should well not, not at all. We should not. We should right. not. Actually, in, in this country where I live in Rwanda, we don't accept that. We have overcome that. We have overcome that. We don't. Yeah. We do not. Our, our national uh, language is Kinyarwanda. When the president is giving a speech, he speaks in Kinyarwanda. When it is international, he speaks in English. But Kinyarwanda comes first. So it's us to put ourselves where we want to be. Where we belong. We belong on top. We don't belong on the bottom. Stella, I wish that you had got in here early and speak the things that you're speaking now. Uh, and first of all, <laughs> I thank you because you've always been quiet when you came in, but obviously it's your time to, uh, to teach all of us how yes. we need to be and how we should be. And your country is setting the stage for the entire continent of Africa. I think your president has that vision. And uh, if other leaders would follow what he is doing, and I've been noticing your country where you guys had the, uh, the genocide that occurred there and yet still today, look at your country, 
Look where you guys yes, are. Yes, and we are united now. We are united because we wanted to build a country. Right. We forgave each other. We forgave each other. And we came together, and now the country is number one in Africa. It's number one. It's because we are proud people. We have to be proud. We have to be proud of ourselves. We know where we belong. We belong on the top. So if we come together, we can be number one. Sorry, my phone is terrible. No, <laughs> no, you're sorry. wonderful. Who is 435981? I, I see you just came in and we're getting ready to uh, join the meeting, but uh, certainly want to recognize you. Hello. Pardon? 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 No, there's somebody, my, else. My... somebody else just came in. I think they're yes. trying. Yes. Yes. Hello? Okay. Yes. Hi. How are you? Hello. Okay, well, if that's nobody else have any more closing comments, Mr. Aluka, I remember the last time you prayed, you were very impressive. May I ask that you pray to close our meeting, please, sir? Well, I just, can, before he closes, can I, I just want to give a closing comment real quick. Please, before. please do, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you all for coming and thank you for having me. It was a pleasure as always. And I look forward to our next conversation and just seeing how we are uniting here as African-Americans and Africans as well. I believe the way forward for us is up and together. So we'll continue to unify as Africans and African-Americans. And I think when we join forces, we'll be unstoppable. So um, it's been a pleasure. And I look forward to what's in store for our next uh, conversation. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let me say this, please. And Oluka, I'm going to ask you to say the closing prayer. The t-shirts that everybody ordered, they should be shipping out in the next week or so. And I thank everybody for participating with the initiative. To get your picture inserted in the graphics of the, of the song African Unite. Uh, that song has been published out, so if you guys want to download it, please support Mr. Lemon Black. Also, we have another project that's in the works. Uh, is the song will be titled Climate Change. And uh, if you guys, this whole conversation today leads into that direction of a climate change, and you will hear a song that will be developed by Mr. Lemon Black. So please stay with him, okay? But uh, with that, Mr. Luca, if you'll unmute yourself and give us a closing prayer. We would appreciate it. And again, everybody, if you don't know, Mr. Luca is aspiring one day to be the president of Nigeria. So I want him to close our meeting. All right, let's pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we have Father, we thank you. We thank you for a time like this. We thank you for giving us the grace. We thank you for giving us a peaceful environment. We thank you for a fair weather. We thank you for bringing people from all walks of life, from different countries, to come and see, give solution to the challenges of Africa. Lord, we thank you from how we started to this moment. We give you all the glory. Lord, as we close this meeting, we are not leaving ourselves, but we're not leaving your presence. We're gonna remain in your presence. We'll be under your watch. We're gonna be under your guard till we meet again. Father, we thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for our families. We thank you as we go back to our respective countries. Father, you will be with us and make Africa unite and make everyone come together to have, to get this feeling that we are not inferior people. We thank you for everything you have done. Thank you everlasting Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Everybody enjoy your wonderful day. And I again thank everyone. Hi, Ron. Thank you very much. Uh, please, Hi, um, Ron. Be before we all go, um, I would like to have um, contact information for everybody that I haven't. Um, um, I, I have reached out to most of you during the course of this call asking you 
for your contact or, 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 or asking you to be my friend on Facebook. So if I can have that information, I have just sent Stella a chat message. So if, if she's still with us, uh, Stella, if you can just give me your WhatsApp uh, contact information or Facebook page, uh, I would love to stay in contact with you. Everybody else I've already reached out to. Thank you, sir. Speak to you just now. Great. Thank you. And Valerie, thank you for sharing okay. your beautiful Good smile. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you for organizing these meetings, too. And you tell Professor G, I am a little upset with him, not totally, because I know he's busy, but uh, <laughs> he would have been wonderfully enjoyed today if he had been here. Yes. Ms. He Ms. Absent, uh, tell him we say hello. We I will. Today, okay? Please make him aware. Please. I definitely will. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, look, that being said, I again, I thank everybody for being here. and It has been a blessing for me. And now I can uh, live the day with a lot of joy in my heart because of all of you guys. Okay. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Taran. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you.